So welcome. This is a Fathom podcast. Um, it's a new series. Uh, we called it Those Who Tried, Conversations with the Peace Processors After the Israel-Hamas War. We're absolutely delighted to kick off the series today with a discussion with Elliot Abrams. Uh, during the George W. Bush presidency, Elliot Abrams was Deputy National Security Advisor and NSC staff member at the White House, the man who handled Israeli-Palestinian affairs Quote, day in and day out, as he put it in his memoir of those years, Tested by Zion, which I would recommend anyone to read. It's a fantastic read if you want to understand that period in particular. The interview is going to be the first in a series, as I say, we'll seek out the views of people who have, I think, something very interesting to say about the present conjuncture in light of their past experience, which will have been intimately involved with trying to make peace in the Middle East. Bef the first question I want to put to Elliot today, before we move on to um, his views on the Bush administration years, is fortuitously an organization which he's involved with has just released a report about its own recommendations for what Israel and the international community should be doing now in the context of the Gaza conflict. Um, it's emerged from the Vandenberg Coalition, and the report is called The Day After, A Plan for Gaza. And I wonder, if Elliot, you could start off by telling us a little bit about who's involved in the coalition, why you've produced the report, and what the main recommendations of that report are. Yes, um, happy to do it, and uh, happy to be inaugurating your series. Uh, I hope we do, in fact, inaugurate rather than bury it, but um, I'll do my best. Um, the report was done by a combination of uh, JINSA, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, and the Vandenberg Coalition. Uh, I chair Vandenberg. We started it uh, three plus years ago um, as a home for or network of what I'd call um, Republican or conservative internationalism. Uh, people from the last several Republican administrations um, fighting isolationism. And uh, our advisory board is about 125 now. It's basically 124 Republicans and Joe Lieberman. Um, and we got together with Jinsa to produce a team, the team mostly of people who'd been colleagues in the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration. Uh, we thought, um, most of the proposals for Gaza after the war were not sensible. For example, Israel should govern permanently or the Palestinian Authority should do it, which we thought was not sensible because they are not capable of doing it. Um, so we did um, a serious project. We did about 100 Zoom interviews, two trips to Israel, one to Saudi Arabia, to talk to people who were knowledgeable about this. <laughs> um, Saudis, Emiratis, Americans, Palestinians, Israelis, former officials, uh, current officials, um, uh, military people, intelligence people. Uh, the basic uh, suggestion is that there be formed what we call an international trust for Gaza reconstruction. Uh, it would be formed by a number of governments, starting with the US, Israel, Egypt, Saudis, Emiratis, uh, countries that wish Gaza well and have some obvious role uh, for differing reasons in the future of Gaza. This trust would, in essence, constitute a kind of government for Gaza for the next couple of years. It would be the funnel for funding we thought the funding should go through the trust, which could then disseminate it through uh, the World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, uh, NGOs. It would work with an advisory council of Gazans, of Palestinians, who live there or who live in the diaspora. And it would have to work up a plan for security. Security is gonna be messy. Um, there's no easy answer to it, but we thought you start with several thousand Palestinian police who are there 
and who are not of, uh, really Hamas people, they were Fatah people. You add to this um, working with the clans or Hamulas, which exist in Gaza. And we know that the Israelis have already begun to try doing this, uh, working with clans, working with business groups uh, to get food in. Um, you add to that, we hope, governments that are willing to help. For example, if the Egyptians are building, as they are, a tent city for 10,000 people on the Gaza-Egyptian border, they should provide security for that tent city. If the Emirates are going to build a tent city for 10 or 20 or 30,000 people, they should provide security for their tent city. Um, and finally, private military companies. We know that um, many NGOs and even UN agencies use private security uh, around the world. And uh, we talked to a number of people involved in this and think that that's a, they have a contribution to make as well when it comes to protecting, um, preventing looting, protecting uh, convoys of uh, humanitarian aid. We've seen recently that's needed in Gaza. Um, so that's, that's the kind of basic outline of the plan. The, um, some people might say one missing element is um, the supranational. A lot of people are very keen for the United Nations to play a leading role in, in this. You seem more focused on a multinational alliance of states with the capacity and the, the motivation to, to do a job there. Why is that? Why, why are you skeptical about a, a UN superintendency of that process? Uh, Chris, the UN has failed in so many ways. Um, UNRWA is a UN agency, and UNRWA, we now know, if we didn't know it before, is completely riddled with people from Hamas and was allowing Hamas to use its facilities uh, as warehouses, as headquarters. Um, UNRWA cannot be trusted. The UN as an institution is generally hostile to Israel, uh, and the Israelis don't trust it. We thought it would be much better to have a completely independent entity created, which could work with UN agencies when that was useful, but not rely on the UN as the central uh, body here. Ask one more question about security, then I'll, I'll, I'll ask Caleb to, to come in. Um, I guess a cynic or a skeptic would say, why would any nation state want to put its forces in line for what could possibly be hit and run ongoing terrorist attacks from Hamas holdouts, um, Iranian influences on the horizon would be trying to destabilize the situation. It's 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 a big ask for any nation state to, to get involved in that. Why do you think they would? They might not. Uh, your point is a fair one. And our thought was not to ask them to come in to be the police or the security force, but rather, um, to talk to states, Arab states, or anybody else who's willing about um, playing very special roles. For example, as I noted, if if you, let's say the Saudis are building uh, a community, a tent city, a refugee camp, um, police that up, the one that you yourselves are building. Uh, but, but your point is fair, they may be unwilling, which is why we thought private uh, forces might have a role that would be less politically sensitive. I'm sure we'll, we'll get to kind of we'll get to political horizon aspects, but I'm just to what extent you can share your conversations with the Emiratis and the Saudis, etc. Is is there a type of kind of quid pro quo or involvement in what is quite a messy issue and what is not really there? primary interest? Um, they're concerned about both domestic public opinion. They are not democracies, obviously, but they they care about their own publics, particularly the Saudis, because they have a very large public, um, 25, 30 million Saudis. Um, and the Palestinian cause is a popular one. So that leads them to want to do something or be seen to doing something positive. Thus, we see the Emiratis involved in the newly announced American uh, maritime 
supply uh, project. Um, so I think that they're open to thinking about this. Yes, they're all worried about the possibility that their people might be killed or that they might end up in conflict with the Israelis in a particular uh, location in, in Gaza. So yeah, they are all concerned. We didn't find them saying, this is a terrible idea, go away. Uh, the reaction was more of a, hmm, we'll look at this, we'll study this. Look, we're not, we're not expecting any government, Arab or American, to say, Eureka, this is it. We wanted to introduce some of these ideas into circulation as governments uh, put together their plans. If we could, if we could go back twenty years, uh, Elliot, you know, from, from late two thousand and two to the end of the Bush uh, presidency, you, you you were extremely close to the heart of what subsequently became known as as the roadmap. Um, then to uh, Ariel Sharon's disengagement. Uh, in fact, if if we remember correctly, you may have been the first American even to hear about it. Um, yep. And then subsequently, the Annapolis process with, with Ehud Olmert and, and Mahmoud Abbas tried and failed to, to make peace. Um, and as Alan mentioned, your, your book, Tested by Zion, which I can also uh, say is, is, is an excellent um, look at that time. Um, I think one of, one of your main conclusions is, is uh, you know, to quote, without a decent, honest and competent Palestinian government, no kind of progress towards peace and prosperity for Palestinians is possible. Stop looking for a magic formula conjured up in a diplomatic salon, salon you write, uh, and focus instead on building up in the West Bank, slowly step by step, a peaceful democratic Palestinian state, a focus on institution building, on nation building, on a decent political culture, not dramatic diplomatic breakthroughs by finding a formula on words. So, so firstly, is that a fair reading of, of your perspective? Um, we'd be fascinated to know how you arrived at that and what mm. experiences of yours were formative. It, um, it is just, a fair reading. Okay, um, I'll just add, just, just on, on my rereading, right. um, you've, you've got a great quote. You say you were struck by a comment by Ehud Barak, who said that after decades, I'm still not clear on the true position of the Palestinian leaders. Mm. Um, the closer we get, the more they withdraw. Are they ready for painful decisions? Now, yeah. we're two decades on from your book and, and that comment. And I'm also wondering whether you're closer to understanding that kind of bottom line and, and, and true position. So that's I realize that's a lot for you to, to touch on, but, you know, wherever you want to go yeah. with, with those. Well, things. first, first, um, on the quote you read from the book, you know, I, I remember Tony Blair saying to George Bush, you know, the diplomacy isn't going to create facts on the ground. Facts on the ground are going to have to tell us what the diplomacy can and cannot do. One more, one more quote, Fayyad, Islam Fayyad, <clears throat> the Palestinian prime minister in that period. Fayyad, um, in a speech once, not a private conversation, in a speech once said, you know, Israel wasn't created on May 14th, 1948. It was announced on May 14th. It was created through decades of work by the Zionists, building institutions. Um, <clears throat> and that's what we, we Palestinians have to do, he said. And he was a state builder. Um, the problem, I think, is that there were very few such people. Um, <clears throat> I think it's probably right that Mahmoud Abbas, you know, would like a decent Palestinian state, but he's not willing to do anything for it. For example, he's not willing to squeeze out corruption. He thrives on, he survives on corruption. So does the whole political leadership. So what it, it is not right to say you know, if, if they had magic wands, what kind of Palestine would they create? It is reasonable to say, what are they doing? These are not people who are 18. They've had careers as Palestinian leaders, and they have done next to nothing to create a, a, a decent Palestine. There are exceptions, and Fayyad is, you know, the most famous exception. 
There are others. But if you look at the Fatah leadership um, over decades, you know, uh, these are the people who have named schools and plazas and roads after terrorist murderers. These are the people who've gotten rich through corruption. Um, so I think it is fair to say that Palestinian nationalism remains essentially negative as it has been for a hundred years. It was about defeating the Zionists. And when the Zionists created the state and the world recognized it, it was about destroying that state rather than the positive nationalism of building a Palestinian state that could live side by side as the saying went, side by side in peace and security. Um, so I think I think this is not a um, uh, an intellectual question. It's it's a facts on the ground question. What is what have they done with the power they've had? What kind of Palestine have they created with the leeway they had in the West Bank and Gaza? And the story is terrible, terrible for for Palestinians. Elliot, can I ask uh, a question about Salam Fayyad? Um, I think it's hinted at in your book. I just invite you to to address it. That um, did I detect in in the book a, a, some frustration on your part that people didn't seize that moment and that the Israelis and the Americans didn't give more support to Salam Fayyad? And if that's so, why do you think they didn't? It is. You're you're reading it correctly. <clears throat> it was never anybody's um, priority. Uh, when I would say to Israelis or to top American officials, you know, this is critical, this institution building, this state building, it's more important, much more important than the uh, diplomacy. Uh, you know, Sipi Livni sitting with Abu Allah or Omer with Abbas. This is you know, the answer I would always get was, oh, yeah, 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 we're, we're going to do it all. We're not going to forget about that. We're going to do that, too. But it was always second place. I mean, I, let me give a concrete example. There'd be a round of negotiations coming, let's say, of Olmert and Abbas, or uh, uh, um, Israeli leader, Palestinian leader. And people would say, well, you know, we need, we need something to make the tone improve, to, to uh, let's, let's help it get on better. Let's release prisoners. Uh, and of course, the prisoners were not, you know, a common thief. The prisoners who were to be released were killers. They were terrorists. And I think about that for a minute. You're doing this in theory to make the negotiating session go more smoothly. But what you were doing to make that happen is to release into Palestinian society the worst people in Palestinian society, the very people who are against what you're trying to do diplomatically. This was, you know, this to me was was classically putting the diploma, exactly what Blair warned against, putting the diplomacy over the realities in the West Bank or Gaza. And yet, again, to play devil's advocate, you often hear the argument here in the West that, well, you can only negotiate with the leadership that exists. So often people often give the example of Northern Ireland. It was when we started to talk to McGuinness and Adams that eventually we got the Good Friday Agreement and so on. And I know you're skeptical about a comparison, but can you can you say why you think you were right to um, marginalize Arafat and why you were right to, um, to take that attitude towards terror? Well, I'd say a couple of things. The first is that in a way we did try precisely what was tried um, with respect to the IRA. Um, so the Israelis <clears throat> uh, and the Americans had said, no one may speak to the to the PLO. And then we changed it and the Israelis changed it. And they had their Oslo negotiation and we had, what did we do with Arafat? We brought him to the White House. And there was this great ceremony on the White House lawn. <laughs> but who was he? It turned out that he was the man who wore a gun to the UN General Assembly. It turned out, and, and we learned this, I go through this in detail in the book. Um, we learned that even as all of this was going on, after he'd been to the White House, he was buying weapons 
secretly from Iran. So Arafat had his chance, and he didn't seem to want it. He was unable to make the transition from terrorist leader to political leader. He couldn't do it. He was not interested in, you know, in building better schools. Um, so uh, it just, you know, we, we, we did try it and it failed. Now, one of the reasons, it, I think the main reason it failed was who was the leader? Um, the, the other reason it failed, I think, is that in the IRA case, it was possible to cut off most of the financial and ideological support that was going to the IRA uh, from, from Washington, from Boston, from London, um, and isolate it. No, not isolate it from Gaddafi, but to isolate it substantially. As long as the Islamic Republic of Iran exists, uh, we're not able to isolate uh, Hamas and those forces, uh, terrorist forces in uh, Palestinian society. And in fact, in just take these 20 years since I wrote that book, there's a lot more support from Iran. Uh, back in those days, we actually debated, professors debated, experts debated, how, how, how do you, you think the Iranians would support the Muslim Brotherhood? That's Sunni, it's crazy. Well, turned out not to be crazy. Um, and as long as that support continues and grows, and there's a lot more of it now than there was 20 years ago, you can't, you, you, you're not gonna see the Palestinians make the change that the IRA made. I, I guess with, you know, not, not, not to push the comparison too strong, but the, the thing with, with comparisons, they always work until they don't. I guess some people might argue that the reason that the IRA thing works is because they come to the conclusion that there isn't a military, that the military option is not going to be successful. Um, and I just wonder from your experience to what extent that what happens in the Palestinian national movement regarding that kind of idea of violence over negotiations, negotiations over violence, kind of which is a more uh, effective way uh, in their perspective of, of kind of, you know, liberation, whatever that may mean. I think they're divided. Again, there are people like Fayad who argue against a military approach and Abbas himself has never uh, promoted terrorism. He's said many times in public, he's against it. Um, but from the Iranian and Hamas point of view, uh, the goal remains to destroy Israel. And they don't care how many Palestinians they kill doing it. I mean, if you look at the way Hamas has governed Gaza, those tunnels that it built at fantastic expense, tunnels that extend uh, at greater length than the London tube does, uh, those are not for protecting Palestinians. Those are for protecting Hamas. Uh, they don't care about Palestinians. It's not their concern. Their concern is uh, to destroy Israel. So um, I think the, the how do you how, how do Palestinians defeat those people? Uh, well, one way is um, to try. And when you name parks and schools and plazas after such people, you're not trying. Um, trying also means trying to the extent you can good governance, um, non-corrupt governance. They aren't really trying that. I do. Um, I do think we in the West, if you will, um, have some blame here because. You know, back in the back in the twenties and thirties, it was the British who appointed Amin al Husseini as Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. There were other candidates, and the Americans went along with uh, Arafat. Or maybe the blame there is mostly on the Israelis. That is, for bringing him back from exile and handing him the West Bank and Gaza. So. In two historic occasions, and we we have been responsible for uh, promoting, anointing, celebrating 
just the worst elements of Palestinian society as the leaders. So there's a lot of blame to go around here. Ali, can I ask a question about the, the Annapolis process? Um, in the course of reading your book, I must admit my own view of Annapolis changed quite substantially in that um, I'd previously spoken to people who were involved in the in the process as negotiators, um, a wonderful guy called Tal Becker being, being one of them. Yes, yes. And, um, you know, and I know for a fact from talking to Tal that, that there were serious teams working till the early hours of the morning on maps, and um, they thought they really were closing gaps on some of the core issues. Um, and I guess that can be true as well as that the sense I got from your book was that it's not your word, but there was an element of otherworldliness about the negotiations at times that there was there wasn't actually a chance for a deal, but for various political reasons, parties were pushing really quite quite zealously forward always. Um, and in a, in fact, that might have been one of the reasons why some of the attention to Salam Fayyad and the financial situation of the PA and the step by step approach was kind of neglected. So as you look back now at Annapolis. And on the one hand, people say it was the closest we've come. That's something you hear. And on the other hand, you were inside it. What's your kind of summary view of the process now as as politicians today are looking to restart the talks process, they say? I would accept the term otherworldly in the sense that, um, you know, you had these negotiations going on. I was at a couple of sessions between Sipi Livni and Abu Allah and Saab Arakat. Um, there were a lot of there was a lot of work done. But the question, one question is, <clears throat> did the negotiators on the Palestinian side represent anything? Uh, and how close were they really? I remember a session at which Abu Allah, um, now uh, deceased, uh, but an important Palestinian negotiator, um, was unwilling to say that he could accept Ma'le and Adumim and Ariel. Ma'ale, Adumi, and Ariel, 38,000 people, 20,000 people, respectively. If you think the Israelis are going to get out of Ma'ale, Adumi, and Ariel, this is not a serious negotiation. I also remember a session where Livni, now this was for political reasons, but she, because she was running for prime minister, uh, she said to Abu Allah, if you raise Jerusalem again, I'm leaving. And one thing they never closed in on was Jerusalem. Now, Olmert did. He kind of jumped the process and said, I have a plan. We're, we're talking now about the summer and fall of 2008. Um, Olmert had already announced that he was leaving as prime minister. Combination of the effect of the Lebanon war in on his popularity and then the indictments. Under Israeli law, he was then a caretaker prime minister who should not have made vast, important, historic decisions, but he was doing it anyway. And he made an offer to Abu Mazen, <clears throat> pardon me, he made an offer to Abu Mazen that, for example, divided Jerusalem, really internationalized Jerusalem under a committee that included Israelis, Palestinians, Saudis, Jordanians, I can't even remember the full detail. And I remember thinking, then this won't pass the cabinet, his own cabinet. And if it were to get through the cabinet, it wouldn't get through the Knesset. Um, it was unreal and actually very dangerous, I think, because had Olmert made an offer that his own cabinet or the Knesset um, turned down, rejected, after Abu Mazen accepted it, then for the till the end of time, the you know, the narrative would have been the Palestinians said yes to peace, and the Israelis said no to peace. Now Abu Mazen didn't accept it for other reasons, but um all of this is being done at you know this wonderful diplomatic level. Um meanwhile, on the ground, you know, there is Hamas growing stronger, winning an election. Um there's uh, Abbas afraid to hold an election because he'll lose because he's so incredibly unpopular. And there's Olmert, who's got at that point maybe 20% approval in the polls and has already resigned and Israel's on its way to an election. So what are we doing here? That was 
That was my view. And I, in the book, tell the story of being at Annapolis, um, you know, which was a, uh, the, the conference was in a very big room with uh, representatives of something like 30 countries. Um, and I got up at one point, left the room, and one of the Arab foreign ministers happened to get up at the same time. And he and I stood at the edge of the room and looked back into it. And he said to me, an important Arab country, you do know what is going to come of all this. And I said, tell me. And he said, nothing. And he was right in the end. Can we explore then? Um, so recently you wrote an article in Tablet Magazine called The Two-State Delusion. Yes. On the other hand, the report um, that we began this discussion talking about does say that you want to say a political horizon for the two-state solution. Certainly here in the UK, we have um, all, all parties pushing very strongly for the two-state solution, and it's still the international community's default position. Um, yeah. where, where to start? Fathom 2 as a journal has, has put enormous amount of work into trying to talk to people about how to put some life back into the the two-state paradigm, as we like to call it, rather than solution, because we think the political horizon might need to be pushed some distance mm. if you want to be realistic about it. Um, let me start off somewhere pessimistic and see, see how you, what, what you have to say, which is when I interviewed Benny Bagan, he said the moment when he thought the two-state solution, he knew it was impossible with the Palestinians, was when he read Mahmoud Abbas tell the New York Times after Annapolis that the reason he wasn't able to respond positively to Alma was because the gaps were great. And Benny Bagan said to me, look, if the gaps were great for him after Annapolis, which is this kind of unreal deal that, as you say, might not go through the cabinet, then the best that we can offer is never going to match yeah. the concessions that they can make. And, and there is more from people who've been involved in this process than those who haven't, I think, a, a pessimism about as we move forward. So do you... Where do you stand on that? Because how, how you still think there's a political horizon for two states. So how how do you think, given the history, people can begin to move towards it? Well, let me say first, um, we propose a plan for Gaza after uh, the war. Um, you know, which there were what ten of us in this committee, and we wanted to make it clear that if you favor the two state solution, then you need to change the situation in Gaza, and here's how you can do it. Um, uh, some of us, I think, genuinely favor and believe the two-state solution, believe it realistic. Personally, I don't. I don't think it's realistic. Uh, I can explain why. Please, yeah, why, why is um, that? Well, um, first, there is the problem that nobody was talking about it on October 1st. Uh, to be pushing, rushing now is a victory for terrorism. Because the only reason that it's being done is what has happened on and after October 7th. But, but let's go deeper. Um, I certainly don't think it's plausible while um, the Islamic Republic of Iran is trying to turn what the Israelis call the ring of fire into a um, system of surrounding Israel with enemies. Uh, which are literally attacking it, Gaza, uh, Hamas, uh, Lebanon, Hezbollah, Yemen, the Houthis. Um, they're, they're building this ring, and they have a goal. The goal is death to Israel. It's, it, to them, it's not a slogan. It is, a, it is an objective. Um, we have seen what happened in Gaza. If you create a Palestinian state in the West Bank, the Iranians will be licking their chops. Okay. Now let's turn that into what Gaza was. Well, people say, well, you know, that can't be done. Why can't it be done? There is a border with Syria through which weapons can be passed. Right now, they're doing it. Um, uh, the Jordanians try to stop it. The Israelis try to stop it. There's been, there are many more weapons in the West Bank now than there were a few years ago. But if there were a Palestinian sovereign state, remember, sovereign state, then every Israeli effort to stop it the way they try now in the West Bank 
is an act of war. You're invading a sovereign state. People say, well, no, 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 that'll be demilitarized. What does that mean? First of all, it needs a police force. Any locality does. What happens when that police force says, you know, we, we, we need armored cars. We need machine guns. So we need a SWAT team. What happens when they want an Iranian embassy? Uh, and, you know, embassies have diplomatic pouches. And that doesn't mean an envelope. And diplomatic pouch can be a truck. What's in it? None of your business. The sovereign state. Who is going to enforce? Let, let's suppose that the Palestinians agree to some of these things, limitations. Who's going to enforce them? There will immediately be a, a stab in the back legend about the people it, who agreed to these things. Just as happened after in Germany after Versailles. And just as happened in the Rhineland. Somebody is going to have to enforce or not enforce violations. Who will it be? Come on, it's going to be the Israelis who either do or don't. And when they do, the UN and the EU and everybody else will land on them for being warmongers. So that's what is being created in today's circumstances, uh, by the, to my mind, by the creation of a Palestinian state. Now, if you say, well, what we're talking about 10 or 20 years, okay, if the Islamic Republic of Iran is gone, I think that does change the Middle East. But I do wonder in the long run, um, why is it essential to have a Palestinian state? I mean, let's go to the question of rights. How about a Kurdish state? What about Tibet? What about the Basques? Tell me why the Kurds don't deserve a state. Um, you know, there, as I, 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 think, I think an independent Kurdistan would stand on its own feet. But think about an independent Palestine. Um, large population, no resources. <clears throat> um, landlocked. Uh, how's it going to survive? Won't it really need to depend on either Jordan or Israel? So my own view is that the, the fundamental decision of the British and the UN for partition was correct. It is better for Palestinians and better for Israelis. The question in my mind is, what is that Palestinian entity? And it seems to me it makes much more sense for it to be in confederation with a state than an independent uh, state on its own. And that would be Jordan. It would be, because if you ask, you know, which makes more sense, a confederate with a Jewish Hebrew-speaking state or with a Muslim Arab Arabic speaking state, the latter makes more sense. Khaled? Khaled, do you have any follow up for that? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I'm just wondering, Elliot, whether. You know, you you write in in the two state delusion about about the the polling in the West, particularly depressing polling in the yes, West Bank yes. and Gaza after yeah. October seventh. Um, interesting for interesting for, for me actually to see how much that contrasted with Israel's Arab citizens and and kind of the the distinctions between them. But I'm interested in you know you're you're quite pessimistic about uh, kind of the Palestinian leadership at the moment. I'm I'm just wondering kind of looking forward in the Maybe the medium term, um, you know, whether you do see any hope for a Palestinian leadership emerging um, that, that would be more open to kind of coexistence and, um, um, may, you know, I'd like to think the answer to that is yes. It will depend in part, I think, on to say it for the eighth time, Iran. I mean, what it is doing to try uh, to radicalize Palestine. Um, and it depends partly on us, if you will, the West, uh, 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 including Israel. Who do we empower? If you go back to Oslo, we empowered Arafat. Um, and we didn't really make an effort until, until, I would say, the middle years of the George W. Bush administration, 2003, 4, 5. We made no effort. 
um, we did not say, no, we won't deal with thugs and thieves. We did not insist in a, in a place that was living really on our foreign assistance budgets. We did not insist on clean government. We did not say, um, no, you may not name a school after a woman who murdered children. We did not say, no, you may not pay salaries to murderers in Israeli prisons, and you may not pay salaries on a sliding scale that depends on how terrible their crime was. We just went along with all this. So, you know, we shouldn't be so shocked that it has a significant effect. My fear is now that uh, the, the, the turnaround or the turn away from that will be awfully slow. It can be done. I mean, look at Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is year by year changing its textbooks. And the, the committees and NGOs that study Saudi textbooks say, you know, year after year, yeah, they're squeezing out the hatred of Christians and Jews. Uh, th that's been very slow in the West Bank and obviously in Gaza hasn't happened at all. Um, not even in, not only in Hamas schools, but UNRWA schools. Um, we have an opportunity now to begin that, but you know, it's a generational change. Those who talk about, I think, Ellen, you mentioned 10 or 20 years. I think that's right because it would be really dangerous to create a Palestine now a Palestinian state um, whose people have been brainwashed into uh, deep hatred of Jews and Christians. Uh, and I'm afraid um, it, it will take a while. It's interesting to me, and I say this in the Two State Delusion article, it's interesting that everybody wants, you know, you look at um, uh, Borrell in the EU and, and Blinken for the US and everybody talks about an independent sovereign Palestine. They never add the word democratic. And I think one of the reasons is they're afraid. They're afraid that if you had a free election, Hamas would win. Well, if that's what Palestinians want, then why create a Palestinian state that will be uh, militaristic and revanchist and, and want conflict with Israel? How, how much do you worry about pressure upon Israel to give way to an unsafe two-state solution? Um, have, have in mind different levels. So in the UK, um, our Foreign Secretary David Cameron's been pushing pretty strongly. Some Conservative MPs are objecting to it. They demanded a meeting with him about what they call a sniping against Israel. But he seems very keen on pushing for the two-state solution. Burrell, the EU rep you mentioned, he's been saying Israel shouldn't have a veto. No one should have a veto. We should push on. The NGO world and the protesters in the West, um, whether it's on the street where they're not singing for the two-state solution, they're singing intifada, intifada. Um, our, our intellectual journals, you know, so the the London Review of Books, for instance, was a place where you could find out that Abbas was a, a sellout and a collaborator, and you know we should support the resistance of Hamas. Yeah. So, it's it's quite hard to identify around the world the kind of sober, serious voices that understand what the obstacles are for Israel simply getting out of the West Bank, and the, and the pressure seems to be building up for them to make a make a big mistake there. I mean, is that something to worry about, or or no? Yeah, it, it is, because I, I think it's politics over realism. Um, and, uh, you know, the Israelis don't have that luxury because they're the ones uh, who are the target of both Iran and the Palestinian extremism of the Hamas variety. Um, what I hope is that um, this will lead to a political horizon of Palestinian statehood but that the immediate steps will be much more sensible. Uh, for example, if, if you want Palestinian statehood, you know, I would argue, okay, one of the first things you need to do is to figure out a program to squeeze corruption out of Palestinian politics. One of the first things you should do is to attend to the question of schools, teaching, textbooks, 
so that you're building a polity that will be able to support uh, a sensible, moderate um, uh, government that will try to better Palestinians rather than attacking Jews. I mean, there are things you can do with Palestinian economy um, in the West Bank, um, obviously rebuilding Gaza. Um, okay, those are steps that should be taken, whether you favor a Palestinian state in one year or in 21 years. Um, efforts to do, I mean, to do things like, uh, let's recognize a Palestinian state now, tomorrow, uh, I think take leave of reality and are not going to help actual living Palestinians in any way. Aleph? No, I think you, I think you can finish off now. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're coming towards the end of our, our time, um, which has been a fantastic interview. Um, I'm going to throw one question in at the end, which is kind of a concern of mine, so it's a kind of selfish thing, this. Um, to me, there seems to be a lot of unreality about the conversation about Israel-Palestine. Um, so it's become um, an issue around which a lot of people have opinions, but not a lot of people have any knowledge, um, whether that's you know a lot of the marches, even some of the politicians and so on. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts ab about that, about the state of Western, almost of Western intellectual culture, West, the West's ability to be serious about the threats it faces. I mean, at the minute, we seem to be refusing to support Ukraine, even though it's doing the job of NATO single-handed and holding back Putin. Um, is, is there a kind of unseriousness about the West today that we need to think about? I have a different take on it. I'm struck, for example, in the United States, the view of China and Russia has changed a lot over the last, I don't know, five years. Um, and the, the view of China as a hostile power, not a partner, has become um, very widespread. It's a consensus. I think it's growing in Europe. The, the view of Russia in Europe has changed greatly. So I would argue that actually in many ways, both in Europe and in the US, there's more realism about international politics, but not about the Middle East. Uh, the, there's, there is no realism about the Iranian nuclear program. We keep getting warned more and more by the head of the IAEA, Rafael Grossi, but we don't want to do anything about it. Um, and on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we don't, and particularly uh, more in Europe than in the U.S., but even in the U.S. you see lots of demonstrations um, that I think are uh, both anti-Zionist and fundamentally anti-Semitic. So to borrow a phrase, um, you know, Israel, it seems to me, is, is, is different and unique. And it is, if you will, the Jew among nations. Um, that is, it is becoming the target of a very widespread and um, uh, more visibly uh, present and deep anti-Semitism um, to an extent that I think has shocked um, certainly Jews, both in Europe and in the United States, um, you now see manifestations of anti-Semitism that you didn't see uh, a year or two ago. So I, I think it's not a, um, a general sense of unreality. I think it's a particular um, view of the Middle East that that is uh, one of whose main ingredients is um, hatred of Jews. Sorry to end on a on yeah. a uh, sour it's note like, like that. But so there's I, good I'll news. Be... There's good news and bad news. The good yeah. news is it's not a global phenomenon <laughs> of, of lack of realism. The bad news oh. is uh, that it happens to be directed in the place where the Jewish state is located. Uh, that's my view. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, Elliot. I'm sure you said at the beginning you hope this interview would kick off the series. I, th I think it has. I really think people will be right. fascinated to hear your reflections on on the the past and the present. So thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.